to them, I'm sure they look at it as a, as a wonderful thing. They see it as um, an end of nationhood, as it has been historically defined. They see that as advantageous, they say, because it'll put an end to war and so forth. And, um, and they can sell the idea as a great step toward uh, brotherhood and a unified globe and so forth. They use all of these things to make it sound good. But when you start examining the actual policies that they're instituting, it's not so hot. It's based on the principle of collectivism, as I've said several times, and that means it's all powerful government. It's a tyrannical government. It's the same kind of a system that uh, Joseph Stalin had in mind, and we fought a Cold War and did a lot of other things to make sure that that didn't happen. The same kind of a system that Mao Zedong had in mind, and all of the great collectivists of history have had this unified global government based on the model of collectivism as their goal, and we fought against it until recently. Now we are actually the greatest uh, advocates of it ourselves. We don't call it uh, tyranny. We don't call it communism. We have a better name for it. The name they have chosen is the New World Order. But when you examine its nature and its essence, it is a collectivist system, powerful government, little people at the bottom taking orders. We've seen the nations of Europe uh, amalgamate into the European Union. The sovereignty of all of the European uh, nations has been pretty well lost now to the European Union. And they've always said that was a stepping stone toward the creation of a true world government, is to unite the smaller governments of the world first into regional groupings, such as the European Union. They have one in mind for Asia and Africa. And now they're talking about doing the same on the North American continent called the North American Union, and it'll be a merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada, a process that they deny. A new world order. To begin to establish the new world order. We needed a new world order. Global governance and global agreements. A new world order. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Secorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. We have seen the, uh, the euro, a replacement of national currencies in Europe, a single regional currency. Now they're talking about the same thing here in the United States. To get rid of the U.S. dollar, get rid of the uh, Mexican peso and the Canadian dollar, and create a new currency for the three. They'll probably call it the Amaro. Step by step, this structure of world government based on the model of collectivism is being erected. The Illuminati were to obtain control of the press and all other agencies which distribute information to the public. News and information was to be slanted so the Goyams would come to believe that a one world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. finish revising the age-old conspiracy and modernizing it, he said that communism, Jacobinism, world federalism, political Zionism, and any and all other organizations that had internationalism or one world government as their ultimate aim were to be organized, financed, directed, and controlled by the members of the Illuminati.
The overall strategy concerning the existence of the Illuminati was delineated by Weishaupt. He said this, quote, control the very fact of our existence. If they discover us, conceal our real objective by profession of benevolence. If our real objective is to stay perceived, pretend to disband and relinquish the whole thing. But assume another name and put forth new agents. And that is what they have done over the years. Now let's go back to the events that followed the rape of our Constitution by the passage of the Federal Reserve Act of the 16th Amendment. It was in 1908 that Schiff decided the time had come for his seizure of our money system. In the fall of that year, they assembled in secret conclave at the Jekyll Island Hunt Club, owned by J.P. Morgan at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Among those present were J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Paul Warburg, in short, all of the international bankers in America, all of them members of the hierarchy of the Illuminati's great conspiracy. A week later, they emerged with what they called the Federal Reserve System. Senator Aldrich was the stooge who was to railroad it through Congress. They would first have to plant their man, an obedient stooge, in the White House to sign the Federal Reserve Act into law. With Wilson completely under their control, the masterminds of the great conspiracy put in motion their next, and what they hoped, would be their final steps to achieve their one world government. The first of those steps was to be World War I. Why war? Simple. The only excuse for a one world government is that it will supposedly ensure peace. The only thing that can make people cry for peace is war. History records that World War I was precipitated by a trivial incident. That incident was the assassination of an Austrian Archduke arranged by the Illuminati masterminds. The war followed. By 1917, the conspirators had achieved their primary objective. All of Europe was in a state of destitution. All the peoples were war-weary and crying for peace. And the outcome, too, was all set. It was to come as soon as the United States would be hurled in on the side of the Allies. And that was all set to happen immediately after Wilson's re-election. Thus, when it was proposed by Wilson to set up a League of Nations to ensure peace, all the great nations jumped on that bandwagon without even stopping to read the fine print in that insurance policy. That is all but one, the United States, the very one that Schiff and his co-conspirators least expected would balk. He found himself faced by a solidly united people and by a loyal press whose only ideology was Americanism and the American way of life. And that was the end of the League of Nations as a corridor into one world government. Actually, that was the format set by the Illuminati and Nathan Rothschild at the turn of the 19th century. They first maneuvered all of Europe into the Napoleonic Wars. Then the Congress in Vienna, which they, and particularly Rothschild, planned to transform into a League of Nations which was to have been the housing for their one world government. That was the format the House of Rothschild and Jacob Schiff decided to employ to achieve their objective in 1914. Of course they knew that that same format had failed in 1814, but they theorized that was only because the Tsar of Russia had torpedoed that scheme. They'd make sure that after the New World War, they were conspiring, there'd be no Tsar of Russia around to throw monkey wrenches into the machinery. And the Russian Bolsheviki were to be their instruments in this particular plot. The following list shows names of some of the international Jewish bankers who bankrolled the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Jacob Schiff. Today it is estimated that Jacob's grandson, John Schiff, 
sank about $20 million into the final triumph of Bolshevism in Russia. Gondenheim, Max Brotten, Felix Warburg, Otto Kahn, Mortimer Schiff, S.H. Henner, Lazare Brothers, Gunsborg Bank, Bayer & Co., Nyon Baron of Stockholm, Rothschilds of London. Under Jewish pressure, this report was destroyed by the U.S. State Department. The British government knew of secret Jewish plans. One of their spies said, unless Bolshevism is nipped in the bud, it is bound to spread over the whole world, as it is organized and worked by Jews, whose object is to destroy for their own ends the existing order of things, break down the old order and bring in the new world order. Fundamentally, Judaism is anti-Christian. To the crux of the whole one world government plot and the maneuvering necessary to create another League of Nations to house such a government. As I have already stated, the conspirators knew that only another world war was vital for the success of their plot. Clinton Roosevelt, Horace Greeley and Charles Dana, foremost newspaper publishers of that time, were appointed to head a committee to raise funds for the new venture. Of course, most of the funds were provided by the Rothschilds. And this fund was used to finance Karl Marx and Engels when they wrote Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto in Soho, England. While Karl Marx was writing the Communist Manifesto under the direction of one group of Illuminists, while they were writing the Communist Manifesto, a young boy born in April 20th, 1889, in Austria, raised as a young Roman Catholic, would grow up to become a painter and a soldier, and later the number one enemy of the Illuminati, Adolf Hitler. After several rejections of becoming an artist in Vienna, Hitler with great ambitions would join the German Workers' Party to restore his land and abandon the treasonous Treaty of Versailles. Hitler would then create a new central political ideology known as National Socialism based on the fundamentals of Christian values, and the elimination of financial interest slavery. This was built into the NSDAP. In February 27, 1933, a communist revolt burned the Reichstag building. Hitler and his comrades took the opportunity to become leaders of Germany. Ever since then, the Illuminati would use the Allies to provoke National Socialist Germany into war. In 1939, Polish Jews and Bolsheviks would kill around 58,000 ethnic Germans in Danzig. Danzig was part of Germany before the Treaty of Versailles gave it to Poland. Hitler and Schott took immediate action to ensure peace with the Allies to allow Germany to stop the massacres, they refused. The Illuminati got their second world war. Roosevelt, also a godman in the eyes of the American people, followed the same technique in 1941, when he used the prearranged Pearl Harbor attack as his excuse for hurling us into World War II. And in 1945, the conspirators finally achieved the United Nations, their new housing for their one world government. The new world order will bring war in the name of peace. In fact, it has already done so. <laughs>